Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Redeemer Evangelical Covenant Church on Morgan Road in Liverpool, New York, a suburb of Syracuse. We're glad you're here in person, um, and we're glad you're here online. If you are watching us online, and uh, obviously you're not going to get a bulletin from today, but you can find one online just wherever you found us, either on Facebook or through our website, uh, just before or just after uh, this uh, broadcast, you will see a, a link where you can download the program or look at it during the sermon today. And uh, it'll give you sermon notes, it'll give you all the announcements, and uh, we welcome that. And we're glad you're here. We're going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness over us, your grace and mercy that's been poured out. Pray that you would receive this worship today as just sweet aroma to you. We love you, Lord, and we just are thankful for the mission you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. to stand and join us while they sing. You're welcome to do that. Or you can remain in your seat. Open with the lion and the lamb.
and your amazing grace. Hallelujah. Lord, we don't deserve any of it. We didn't buy our way in or work our way in or anything like that. But your grace snatched us away from the pit and into your presence. So, Father, we just acknowledge that without our Savior, Jesus Christ, we would be nowhere and nothing. Father, we love the fact that you have placed this church in Liverpool, New York, for a purpose, for a cause. That you want us to shine like lights on a hill. You want us to join hands with the other churches in our area that believe your word and trust in you. Lord, I pray for all those that don't yet know you, that they would find you either through us or through anything and discover the life that they were meant for. Lord God, be glorified in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, at this point in the service, I usually read uh, a children's story, a gopher story. I started writing these when uh, my youngest or my oldest kids were uh, old enough for me to put them to bed and tell them a story, and most of these ended up uh, not written first. They were just told, made up, told. And then eventually, uh, I realized that uh, when I was pastoring a church, it might be nice for them to hear some of them, so I started writing them down. And I usually read to you a story that's been written sometime in the last... 35 years. Uh, but today I'm reading you a story that was written sometime in the last three hours. So it's brand new. Once upon a time, there was a town called Gopherville. And in Gopherville, there's a gopher named The Gopherville Courthouse is in the middle of Gopherville. That's where important records are kept for the town. It's also where Father, the mayor, has his office. There are other important things in the courthouse as well, but one of the most famous things in the courthouse is the giant mural called the Founding of Gopherville. It is a giant painting of Horatio Hornsnout wearing a huge hat with fruit on it and several gopher settlers in covered wagons making new homes amid trees and streams and grass. No one knew why he wore a hat with fruit on it, but no one questioned it because it was right there in the painting. At the bottom of the mural, it said, Horatio Hornsnout and our valiant founders. Now, the mural was very old. No one in Gopherville was alive when it was painted, and no one was still alive who lived in the days of the founding of Gopherville. Some gophers claimed that their great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was one of the first settlers, or their great-great-great-great-great-grandmother knew the painter of the mural. But others said they were just making that up. Horatio Hornsnout was honored all over town as the founder of Gopherville. There was Hornsnout Elementary School and Horatio Falls on the north side of town. And every year, the Gopherville Gophers celebrated Founder's Day. And all the boy gophers got dressed up like Horatio Hornsnout, and each one wears a hat with fruit on it. Father thought that the mural was looking a little worn out, and it was fading from time, so he decided to hire a mural restoration team to clean the mural and brighten it up a little bit. The team was from Beavertown, and they were the best in the business. A curtain was put in front of the mural, so they were working on it, and no one could see their progress. One day, the head beaver restorer, Bob Beaverly, knocked on Father's door. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think we have a problem. What is it? said Father. We were working in the middle of the mural where Horatio Hornsnout is standing tall and we were cleaning his image and we found something, well, unexpected. And then we worked on the title at the bottom of the mural and, well, we think that you should come and look. And so they left Father's office, walked down the hallway, slipped behind the curtain to look at the mural. Bob Beaverly pointed to the title at the bottom of the mural. The O at the end of Horatio was actually an A. Bob looked at Father. It, it looks like it was originally Horatia, and someone later changed it to Horatio. Then we started cleaning his face and found that his face was actually her face. Father looked at the face and the name, and his mouth fell open as he, as he stared. Then he smiled. He didn't want to laugh, but he couldn't help it. So our founding father was actually our founding mother? Bob nodded. Well, that helps to explain the hat. This will change a lot of things in Gopherville, starting with our history books. 
There was a town council meeting right away where the whole thing was explained and debated. Some council members wanted to cover it back up and not tell anybody about the discovery, but others said truth was the best path to follow. In the end, the mural had a great unveiling and the whole town came to see it. Some people laughed and some were embarrassed for saying that Horatio Hornsnout was their great, 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 great grandfather. Now the waterfall on the north side of town is called Horatia Falls, and at the annual Founders Day Festival, it is the girl gophers who wear the funny hats. The end. Well, uh, last week I started a sermon called A House of Prayer for All Nations. We are uh, in the middle of 30 days of prayer and fasting as a church, and actually several churches in our area have joined hands with us, and they're also doing the same 30-day fast using the same uh, daily uh, themes of what to pray for. And so it got me uh, just praying more and thinking more about prayer. And so then I thought, well, let's start praying as a congregation together. That'll be fun. And I started with uh, mission things to pray for, things throughout the world. And last week, I only got halfway through the 11 things that I wanted to pray for. So today, we're going to pick it up where I left off. First, a quick review. Uh, first, last week, we prayed for uh, God to help the poor of the world. That's a noble thing to pray for. It's all over Scripture to do that. Secondly, we prayed for the sick of the world. And we know that God uh, cares about the sick. We know that uh, as the church, we are called to help the sick, to pray for them. Thirdly, we prayed for the struggling churches throughout the world. Uh, Redeemer has a fine history, heritage. Uh, we are a blessed church. We've been here a long time. And the way things are going, we're going to be here a bit longer, and uh, we're doing really well. There are other churches in the world that are not quite as well off. And this whole COVID-19 thing uh, has thrown a lot of people out of work. That's affected uh, churches' offerings, and some churches are really hurting, much more than we are. So we prayed for them last week. Also, uh, we prayed for the defenseless of the world. We believe that God wants us to care about justice and mercy and so we prayed for those who uh, need justice right now. We prayed uh, for humility and the idea that God would use us in the world, not just to write a check and send it off or to pray for them, but that some of us would actually go into all the world and uh, preach the gospel. And finally, we prayed that God would use us in the world, supernaturally and otherwise. And that's how we ended last week. So I've been using uh, my mission experiences as sort of a template to get into each of these areas of prayer, talk a little bit about that, read a couple verses on the subject, and then we spend a, just a minute or two uh, on prayer for that subject. So I'm going to pick it up with a mission trip that I took to Guyana in 1991. Uh, Jamie, my beautiful wife, uh, taught and danced at the International Worship Symposium. And uh, I was basically there to carry her suitcases. Uh, and I did lead some worship. I was a worship leader at the time. But I'm pretty sure they let me worship because, you know, I couldn't do anything else. And I wanted to do something, so they let me do that. Uh, mostly, Jamie was the star. She taught uh, seminars in how to start a dance company within a church and how to do dance and worship. And they had asked her to come to this international worship symposium and uh, lead various seminars on dancing in the church. Now, what really caught my attention, well, a couple of things did actually, but uh, the one that I remember the most is that there were people that came from all over Guyana to attend this, uh, this uh, symposium. And it was in uh, Georgetown, the capital. It was, Georgetown was the, the most modern city. Uh, I'm not sure that there was much electricity in the whole country at that time in Guyana. It was 1991. And... Um, there were people that literally walked for seven days to get to the symposium. And then, of course, one week of symposium, and they're walking seven days back. And when I heard that, and I saw the, 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 their faces shine in worship, how they wanted to learn what others had learned about worship, and how to do worship in church, and what were the important things, and what did the Bible say about worship, and and what were the new songs being written that we could be singing? And I, I was just amazed at their commitment 
to God in the area of worship. I couldn't imagine walking seven days to get to a conference and then walking seven days back again. 1 Peter 5, 9 says, Resist him, meaning the devil, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And 1 Peter 3, 8, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, being compassionate and humble. And this all makes me think that uh, we should be praying that we appreciate what Christians in the world go through, the sacrifices they make, the suffering they're doing, uh, and how they are trying to do what we're trying to do, worship God and fulfill a mission with much less resources uh, and with much more challenges. So let's just pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge that we are completely blessed in America. We are blessed in Liverpool, New York. We are blessed at Redeemer Church. We are blessed to have friends here. We are blessed that we can have a building to worship in, that we have a sound system, that we have uh, a worship team. Lord, we're just blessed in every way. And Father, we pray for those throughout the world who love you as we do, and yet are, have many more challenges, tougher challenges, to fulfill the mission you've given to them. Lord, let us never forget the blessing that we have and the blessings that you want to pour out on others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, this was actually during that same trip that we went to Guyana. Uh, we stopped in Trinidad. I believe we stopped on the way down. Well, maybe it was the way back. Trinidad is, is an island just off the coast of uh, South America. Guyana is uh, at the top of South America, kind of close to Venezuela, but it's not that far from Trinidad. Guyana is um, mostly English-speaking, I guess. British Guyana is what they call it. And um, so we stopped at Trinidad. It was, uh, at the time, Jamie and I didn't have very much money, and uh, there was a church in Trinidad that says, well, we'll pay for your airline ticket down to Guyana and back if you stop in Trinidad and teach us what you're going to teach in Guyana. So we said, sure, that sounds great. So um, we flew into Trinidad. Again, Jamie worked with their dance company. It was a church that uh, was pretty far along already in worship. The pastor was called Pastor Sammy. And um, I remember they just loved the Lord, and they loved to dance. And Jamie was able to teach them all sorts of things, both biblically and practically, when it came to dance. And I think I may have even led worship once while we stopped there. Um, the church met in an open-air tent. Trinidad uh, isn't a very rich country, uh, had a little more money than Guyana did, but uh, the church was literally in just an open-air tent, like if you were going to buy a car, and it was tent days, and you'd see that's what it was like. Um, and in Trinidad and Guyana and in those countries, a lot of things are open-air because it's so hot. And uh, if you don't have electricity, you don't have air conditioning. So a lot of places would be open, and their whole church was an open-air tent with a bit of a stage and a sound system and uh, chairs throughout. And uh, it made me think of these two verses, John 1, 16. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. You know, if your life is full of blessing, we need to recognize that those blessings all come down from God the Father. The Bible says... Every good gift comes from the Father of lights. And those blessings are really rooted in his grace. His grace is giving us something we don't deserve. And every blessing, when you think about it, that we've received from God is something we didn't deserve. It's part of his grace. We've all received one blessing after another. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. This verse talks about grace abounding to us. God is able to make all grace abound to us. There's nothing he wants to hold back from us. And the reason, or one of the reasons why God pours his grace on us is so that in all things, in other words, everything we face as a church or an individual or a family, everything we face at all times, which means he's at this all the time, he doesn't like bless you and then walk away and maybe come back 10 years later, 
in all things at all times, having all that you need. Uh, it doesn't say having all that you want. It doesn't say having the, the newest, best car on the block. It says having all that you need. And I think that's one of the top priorities for God. He wants to make sure we have what we need. But why is that? Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I think one of the reasons why God blesses us, and in any kind of blessing, for a church blessing, a family blessing, a personal blessing, he blesses us so that we have everything we need to do the work he's called us to do. If I didn't have enough money to eat, and I was starving all the time, and I didn't live in America where you can get food all sorts of places, and if I was just weak from starvation and hunger, I might not be able to do the work that God's called me to do. If I was homeless, if I had no place to live, if I was uh, always looking each night for a place I could hide under a bridge or something like that, it would be hard for me to be a pastor of a church or even to be a witnessing Christian. So God gives me everything that I need in order to do what he's called me to do. Now, since I believe that, it's important for me to realize that most of the blessings that God's given me is so that I can do something. And if I just take the blessings, thank you, God, I, I'm so happy. But I don't ever do the mission that he's called me to. I'm missing something. It's like getting paid to go to work but not really going and continuing to get paid. So I want to pray that we would all remember how very, very blessed we are and the purpose for that blessing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I've been blessed all my life. I was born into a loving family. I grew up in middle-class America, not in poverty in another country. Lord, all my life I've been blessed. I've had friends. I've had education. I've always had enough food to eat. Father, help me never to forget what a privilege it is to serve you, what a privilege it is to be under your care and your blessing. Father, I pray that uh, as I... Uh, remember these things as my belly gets fat with the food that you've provided i would realize that i'm called to walk a path that you've laid out for me don't ever let me forget father encourage the church not only redeemer but all through this area and all through especially the united states that to whom much is given much will be required father put us on the path Make sure our feet are moving, not standing still. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the next mission trip that I went on was Costa Rica in 2000. Uh, I took 10 youth from the church. I was like a youth leader. We went to Costa Rica, uh, including two of my kids. We ministered in various ways in Costa Rica. Um, we helped to build a ministry building. In fact, it's really the only mission trip I ever took uh, where I did hard manual labor. And we went down, and a church was uh, established there, but they didn't have a building, and they had asked youth groups to come down and help build buildings, and so we went down there and uh, helped to build. John 4, 35 and 36 says, Do you not say, four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Luke 10, he told them, and this was Jesus, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. Um, Jesus didn't want his disciples to think, okay, Jesus is with us, it's always going to be like this. And he knew that he was leaving, and he didn't want them to think when Jesus was gone that maybe he should just, they should hang out for a while until he comes back and establishes his kingdom. And he's like, no, uh, it's not four months more than the harvest. The fields are white with harvest right now. Right now is when we need to be thinking about going into, praying for, and supporting the, the mission fields of our world right now and then christ says later you know the truth is the harvest is bigger than the workers we currently have they can't do it all and the answer is not let's make the kingdom of god smaller or try to reach less people it's to pray for more people to enter into the fray to get into the mission field 
to take part in the harvest. And the purpose is that the sower, the one who originated the grace, and the reaper, the ones who are able to bring people to the grace of God, rejoice together. That's for us. I want to pray that God would send workers into the mission field. Heavenly Father, we um, sometimes feel like we have a lot to do here in central New York. There's a whole bunch of people who are hurting, that are hungry. We want to reach out to them. There are a bunch of uh, kids that are walking aimlessly, spiritually aimlessly through this life, and we want to reach them. Lord, there are people that are old and can't even get to a church, and we're trying to reach them. Father, there is so much to do even here, and yet the world is a harvest field. What we see here is just a microcosm of the needs all around the world. We pray that you would raise people up. We know that in foreign countries, that churches in foreign countries are raising up their own missionaries to send them throughout the world, even back here to the States, Father, and we bless that process. We bless all those who are training and raising up missionaries to reach the world. Father, if we never leave to go to the mission field ourselves, let us see our actual daily lives, every step that we take, as being a mission field. Lord, we know your heart is for those who have not yet heard. We know that you are delaying your coming even now so that more can get saved. Father, send us, Father, Send others. Raise them up. Bring people to you any way that you can. In Jesus' name, amen. The, um, the next mission trip, I call it a mission trip, kind of stretching it a little bit, uh, but I went to Israel in 2004, and I went with uh, 30 other pastors at the time. And, uh, you know, it was mostly a sightseeing trip, uh, I was, I'd become very close in Miami with a pastor of a big Baptist church uh, called The Gathering Place. And I know there's a gathering place here in central New York, uh, and I think they are related somehow. They were independent Baptist churches, and uh, he, for a while he left that church, and he was president at um, a college, Baptist seminary somewhere in New York just south of us. And I wish I could remember what it was. But anyway, he was a, a tremendous man. And at the time, I was a church planter. I was just... Uh, like a, I'd been a computer guy all my life, and suddenly I was a pastor, and I was doing all sorts of things wrong. I heard that. I know I'm doing things wrong now, too, but just kidding. Um, but I would go to him. I would just walk in. I'd say, Pastor Padron, can I talk to you? And he was so gracious. He would say, oh, Bill, come in. And some of that may be because Jamie was his uh, chapel director at the time, and she was doing a tremendous job. It lifted that church, like, up three feet. Uh, when she did chapels, and she, he really respected her and the work she was doing. So uh, I would go in, and, and I'd ask him questions, you know, questions that they should have taught me in seminary, but I hadn't been to seminary yet. And so I'd say, like, uh, Pastor Padron, you know, we have about this many people coming to our church plant, and our offices are about this much. It, does that sound right to you? Are we doing okay? And he would just tell me stuff that pastors ought to know. Um, I would have questions about, you know, someone is... Uh, started coming to church, and it seems like they're trying to start their own church out of my church, and I don't know what to do, and he would help me. He answered all sorts of questions, and we got so close that one day he called me up, and he said, Bill, I'm going to take a trip to Israel, and he, had, he went to Israel like twice a year, and he would lead groups, and he knew everything about Israel, and he'd been doing this for like 20 years. He said, I've got this great deal for a thousand dollars. We can fly you to Israel, you stay at the best hotels, you get to see everything you'd want to see, and fly back home again, all for $1,000. And I said, whoa, that sounds really cool. And I said, I will definitely want to come. And then I called him back, I said, now I have this friend who was also uh, like a little church planting guy, and, uh, and I said, can I invite him? And he goes, sure, if he's a pastor, he can come. So uh, my friend and I and uh, 30 other pastors, mostly Baptists from all over the world, actually, um, got on this plane for a thousand bucks and flew to Israel. Um, it was mostly sightseeing, but we we were given the prime treatment. This this trip was sponsored by um, El Al. I think that's isn't that the.
Jewish airline or the Israeli airline. Um, and they wanted, they knew if they could get pastors of big churches, and they didn't know how small my church was, big churches to come, then they would probably get more people from that church to go to Israel at a later time. And they were right. And so they sponsored it. So um, it was like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But we were treated like VIPs. We got to meet the head rabbi in Jerusalem. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a head rabbi. He's like the pope for the Jewish people. And uh, I thought, whoa, well, the, pa- the Pope's like in a Vatican. I mean, he gets a whole city and, and everything's, you know, it's good. And, and this head rabbi was literally in an office building. And when we went to his office, it looked like the office, like a CEO of a, of a business. Um, and he was dressed like a rabbi and somehow he had a suit and tie on. I, I don't know how that worked out. But I remember I was pretty impressed with him. And he met with just us, us, you know, pastors from America. And... Um, you know, most of the, the people on the trip, well, really all of us, were very respectful of everything in Israel. And we, we didn't try to convert the head rabbi to Christianity. Uh, we just, you know, took people as they were. And, um, and we were good. And on that trip, uh, we also met with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, who is now prime minister of Israel, has been for, I don't know, the last 10 years or something. Um, and he met with us in a hotel, like, banquet room, And uh, he just talked, and we were the only ones there. And uh, I remember thinking, this guy may be the smartest man I've ever met, because he just talked and talked, and he said the smartest things. And um, we got our pictures taken with him and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we were able to ask him questions, and I don't think I asked him any questions, but some of the other pastors asked him questions, and, and they were pretty smart questions about, you know, living in an Arab uh, area of the world, and wh- how do you feel about security, and, and why don't you just kick all the Arabs out of Israel, wouldn't that be better, and, and these were questions that Americans would ask, because we don't know, and he would give the smartest answers. Um, that was a highlight of the trip. We actually took a boat and went on the Sea of Galilee, and um, you know, when you're on, the Sea of Galilee is not that big, I think it's what, maybe n- n- seven miles across, and 11 miles up and down, um, and when you're out, and it was, a, it was a calm day, and it was bright and sunny, so we could see most of the, uh, the coast around us. And I could think in my mind, you know, well, that's where Bethsaida is, was, and this is where this other thing, and this is where Jesus fed the 5,000. And, and of course, we had uh, guides who would be telling us all this too. And uh, so it was a fascinating trip. And I, I love the Sea of Galilee. I thought, to be able to see where Jesus walked, uh, that was special. Uh, we went to the Mount of Olives, which is, um, you know, when you read it in Scripture, you kind of get the impression that the Mount of Olives is not that far from uh, Jerusalem. You can see it. And in actuality, it is directly across a little teeny valley from Jerusalem. The city of David, which is raised up, that's where the temple would be and all that, um, is, is like here, and then there's a wall, and then there's a bit of a valley, and then coming out of the valley, it becomes a hill, and that's the Mount of Olives. And uh, we could, there were trees there, and we could stand there, and we could look at all Jerusalem, as Jesus must have looked at Jerusalem when he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Um, and it was, it was the most special time for me. It was, I was just completely blessed, and I'm glad I got to go. Uh, that was also the trip, and I've told you the story probably three or four times, where we were given a special tour uh, that went to see what was under the Wailing Wall, the, uh, the Temple Mount. And at times it was, just, it was a walkway just about this wide with stones all around us. And other times it was bigger because they were es- excavating and uh, we got to see some of the original huge stones that were part of maybe uh, the re- re- restraining wall. Um, the Wailing Wall is, is not like a wall of the temple. It's more like a wall that was going to hold up the earth so that they could build the temple up on top of it. I'm pretty sure that, that there isn't any part of the temple uh, still standing. And besides that, on the Temple Mount, where the temple used to be, is now uh, a Muslim mosque. So we, did, we couldn't go up there. But we did get to go underneath everything, and we got to see, as I explained once before, that that part of the underneath walking tour was on top of this acrylic so we could see what was beneath us. And beneath us were stones and uh, like boulders and part of what was probably closer to Jesus' time because Jerusalem was built and then 
it would be sacked by somebody and uh, everything would be torn down. And then when they go to rebuild Jerusalem, they wouldn't clear away the rubble, they would just build right on top of it. So uh, since Jerusalem has been sacked so many times and rebuilt so many times, um, the actual, let's say, streets where uh, David walked or where Jesus walked are way below the street level of Jerusalem today. So you don't walk down the street and go, I'm walking where Jesus was walking. Well, you're probably like 30 feet above where Jesus was walking. But w when you, we went underneath and there was acrylic and we could see down there, um, it was probably much closer. What we were looking at was, had a better chance of being around uh, when Jesus or people earlier than that uh, were there. And I, I, the most important part to me was as we walked through and we were coming toward the end of the tour, there was that plaque on the wall that said, uh, you are now standing in the spot that is the closest to where the Holy of Holy was. And um, it just hit me that, I mean, I, I'm enjoying everything. Oh, look at that giant boulder. Oh, look at those things. But when I got to that, it's like s the sudden realness of it just hit me that there was a temple. It was built for God. There was a Holy of Holies with an Ark of the Covenant in it, and God's presence would come. And there were times when the presence of God came that nobody could even do their job as priests because God's presence was so strong. And I was standing in the place that would be the closest I could get my body today to where that Ark of the Covenant, where the Holy of Holies was. So it was, that was the trip in 2004. Let me read a couple of verses. Psalm 122.6, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. And in Romans 10.1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. And I would like to pray for protection for Israel and that its people would once again return to their creator. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up the nation of Israel. We lift up Jewish people all over the world. Lord, we know that they were or are your people. And Father, as much as they have strayed from the true faith and rejected your son, the Messiah, I pray that you would draw them back to you. I pray that there would be a great revival among Jewish people, that they would recognize who Jesus is and flock to him. Lord, it seems like your word portends that this will happen. We pray that it would happen quickly, Father, that more and more Jewish people would discover their Messiah and cling to him. Father, I pray that you would protect the nation of Israel. Lord, you said in your word to pray for its peace, so we do. Father, we don't understand everything that's going on over there today. We don't understand uh, our relationship to the nation of Israel in completely, but we believe your word, and if your word says to pray for peace, we will pray for peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, last mission trip uh, was in 2009, and uh, it was to Nicaragua. Um, I took a, a group of youth to an orphanage, in Nicaragua. Um, I was the youth leader pastor at the time, but really the person who led the group uh, was Eric Sampson, who is better known as Eric the Flute Maker. He, it, you can see him on the internet if you look him up. Uh, a completely amazing man. He grows bamboo uh, in his yard, and uh, he creates flutes out of bamboo. And his flutes are not like, you know, the recorder that you got in third grade. He makes flutes that, you know, he puts a, a saxophone mouthpiece on, and he can play it. It sounds just like a saxophone, and the thing's only this big. It's a bamboo flute. Uh, he can play flutes like this, and he's an amazing musician. So he makes all these things. He sells them, and uh, he also plays them. And he's got big ones, small ones, like alto saxophones and bass saxophones. I mean, he's just an amazing guy. But along with being an amazing musician and, and flute maker, uh, he has a heart for Nicaragua. And this particular area that we went to, he has been supporting this orphanage for years. And uh, it's in a town called Cascabel. Uh, if you do a Google search on kids at Cascabel or the kids of Cascabel, uh, you'll see his ministry there. I think he basically just has supported it single-handedly for decades. And these kids, they, they just take in orphans, they teach them about Jesus, and he goes down there 
Um, no, I haven't been down there since 04, so I don't know how closely he is associated with them now. Uh, but he was going once or twice a year uh, to help them, to bring them stuff they needed, to minister to them, uh, and to do whatever God called them to do in the area. So we went with a youth group. And um, some of the highlights of that trip was uh, ministering to the orphans, of course. And I, you know, by 09, I had a video camera. So I would video uh, kids, you know, being taught by our kids or our kids helping them out or playing with them. Uh, I have some beautiful pictures of my youngest two children who went on that trip with us uh, ministering to kids in the orphanage. Um, but one of the things I remember is we went to a soccer field in a town a little bit away from Costco Bell. And uh, we decided we were going to do like a worship service and preach the good news. And uh, so we did that. We worked with one of the local churches. They set up some sound equipment. And they like, tr- brought it in on truck. They set everything up really fast. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Um, and it's like we didn't get there super early. It's like it was like a flash mob. We got in there, set up equipment, started, uh, the musicians started playing right away. They only did a couple of songs. And then they, they asked me to be the preacher, so... Uh, I preached the salvation message. And um, the music was mostly to get people to come. The soccer field was in the middle of a, of a barrio of a neighborhood. And uh, so not too many people were there when we first got there, but the music pulled them in, and more and more people got in. And I thought, more people are going to hear the gospel. This is great. And I'm looking around, and, and our supporting church and the people who are working with us are a little more wary about all the people uh, that were coming. And by the way, this is the trip where um, the name of our youth group at this Baptist church was Revolution, because we wanted to see a revolution happen for the kingdom of God. And we got all these t-shirts made that said, Revolution. And just before we left, we all had them. We were going to all wear them when we were down there. And uh, somebody, I think it was Eric, said, "Uh, Bill, you can't wear those shirts down there. (laughs) The government will arrest us if the rebels don't kill us. Uh, So you can't wear a shirt that says Revolution on it. Um, So, back to the soccer field. So, I start preaching, and man, God gave me a wonderful word. It was awesome, and uh, I invited people to come forward, and they came forward. And it wasn't until afterwards that our team was told by the local church team that that soccer was disputed ground between two rival gangs. And um, when people came... It's like some people came and stood over here and other people came and stood over here. And there were a few that stood in other places. But there were like two big clumps and they were all young men and I thought, yeah, they're all, they're all going to hear the gospel and come. And a lot of them did give their lives to Jesus. Um, but when it was all over, we packed up the stuff and we rode out of there and we were gone. And it wasn't until later that I understood that it was kind of a dangerous thing to do. Um, maybe it was better that I had no clue because I just preached with all boldness and gusto instead of hiding under the trucks, you know. Um, but that was a special time for me. Acts 2.17 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In 1 Timothy 4 don't let anyone look down on you because, of you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I want to end our, our prayer time today just that God would plant a burden for the world in our young people. Um, I thought about, I mean, that was in 2009, so I haven't been on a mission trip for 11 or 12 years now. And I used to go every single year, for sure. Um, and, and I have a burden for missionaries, but I'm getting to the age now that if someone said, hey, Bill, why don't you come? Uh, we're going to take a mission trip to the Congo. Why don't you come with us? I'd be like, oh, really? I'm pretty tired. I don't know if I can do that. And, uh, you know, if God gave me strength and told me to go, I would go. Um, but... I, there's less of a chance that I'll ever take another mission trip right now in my life uh, than some of the young people could from our country. And um, most of the mission trips that I just told you about, I was pretty young. Uh, the first one, just me. Uh, later, me, Jamie, even some with our older two kids who were young then, and then the last one with our younger two kids. But I want to pray that the young people in America and throughout the world 
get a burden for what God is doing in the world. I don't want to say it's just a young man's game or a young person's game, but God, we, we have young people for a reason. We are young for a reason. The strength, I think one of the things the Bible says is the, the strength of a young person is their strength. The strength of an old person is their gray hair. I might be massively misquoting that. Uh, but the idea is that as we get older, hopefully we're getting wiser. Uh, but we're not getting any stronger. So uh, I want to pray that some of the young people, not only in our church or in central New York, but all over the states and the world, would get a burden for the world. I wouldn't mind taking a mission trip today if I had 20 young people that said, we really want to go, we don't know what we're doing, could you make it happen? I could make it happen. Uh, but I wouldn't probably go with 20 old people. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's just the way it is. So I just want to pray for the young people to catch a burden. You know, this, our culture, our society, our times are very distracting for young people. There's a lot of things for young people to think about and to engage in and to put their energy into that is not the mission that God's given us. It just is. And I pray that their eyes would be off of the mundane and onto the eternal, off of the things that are less important to the things that are most important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that in my life you've given me the opportunity to go places, to minister for you. Lord, I know how it changed my life, even the very first trip to Mexico, how it changed my life and how I see what you're doing in the world. Father, I pray for all of our uh, young people here at Redeemer, here in central New York, here in the United States and all around the world, that you would put a fire in their bones, that they would recognize that something is happening in the world that God is doing, and they would join you in that. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, we would see it happen in our lifetime, that a revival would break out, that causes even the young people to lift their eyes up to you and to the mission field. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, thank you. I hope this was uh, as good for you as it was for me. I really enjoyed uh, this idea of sharing things and praying. I may even continue it on for next week. Um, next Sunday is the last Sunday before the election. I hope you're all registered and planning to vote if you haven't already. Um, our 30 days of prayer and fasting ends on November 3rd. Uh, we are praying every day for something. If you don't have one of the booklets, we have some out there. You can grab one. Uh, we also are sending daily reminders of what to pray for each day. Kathy does that. Um, if you're not on our email list and you'd like to be, just call the office or send us an email, and uh, we'll make sure that you start getting those. Wednesday night is my question and answer period, which... I'm just loving so much. I, I don't know if I'll ever go back to having a Bible study on Sunday night. It's just so much fun. Uh, you can watch it. If you have a question you'd like me to tackle, send it to Pastor Bill at MyRedeemer.com. If you have questions for Kathy at the church, you can address that to office at MyRedeemer.com. So God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week.